and welcome to the D6 Damage Q&A. Uh, a little while ago, I posted a video asking for your questions about uh, Pathfinder or any related uh, type of game, and we here at the Dice Bag Crew are here to answer your questions. I am D6. I'm D8. I think I was D2. And I know I'm D12. Uh, so, for the sake of clarity, yes, D2 is, in fact, D2. He is not some okay, other cool. kind of mysterious shape yet Thanks. to be quantified. I'm, I'm, I'm glad I'm not having an identity crisis. I want to be D1! <laughs> Why do well, I always have to be second? Wouldn't that just be like a, a ball? Or some kind of yeah. weird, like, one-sided yeah, shape? A, no, no, no. It's, it, it, it's a marble that just says, I'm the DM, I can do what I want. <laughs> I'm the DM, I can do what I want. <laughs> <laughs> I've I've used that before. It was very funny the entire time, I promise. <laughs> it didn't get old at any point in time. <laughs> it was very funny the entire time. All right, so without further ado, shoot. let's get uh, right into the questions. Our first one uh, comes from Pablo. Your Inquisitor Guide informed my choice of character in my current Pathfinder 1e game, uh, which has been running for about 18 months. Congratulations on making it that long, Pablo. Yeah. Not all games uh, get past uh, the first couple sessions. Yeah, it's certainly you true. Quite the marathon. My question you... is, what is your opinion on archers being OP in 1E? Uh, my GM has nerfed a number of feats, etc. for my specific build, a half-orc Inquisitor archer. I find... Uh, I find that on a good day, I can do a fair amount of damage, although I rarely hit more than half the time. But at our level 13, uh, the casters are banishing enemies or just spamming fireballs or summoning dinosaurs. Um, well, guys, what are your thoughts? Uh, well, first uh, I'd say I don't feel that archers are particularly OP. I think they're powerful, but um, not any more powerful than any other it, what you're you're coming across is you're coming across the issue of marshall versus caster in a lot of ways and one of the ways that marshall can keep up to, with casters is things like the machine gun archer builds or uh the like hammer of god melee builds right i think that all classes at some point have a pretty nuts you know, output, uh, and uh, I, I don't know, I, I've never felt specifically that archers were more, more powerful than other things. Uh, I do know, I have done the math between, like, a two-hander versus an archer build, and the archer can get out slightly more damage, but, you know, it's it, it puts a lot into the dice on whether or not you're going to hit, because you're doing multiple attacks. Uh, D12, what are your thoughts? I mostly agree with the uh d8 on that one it's a lot of the uh thought process on marshall versus caster casters innately you know while they have fuel they're powerful and then it, they kind of drop off as they use up all their fuel whereas archers tend to have that same power level the entire time so some dms tend to think of them as stronger without really you know fully doing either all the math on the particular archer or maybe you know you have a particular build that is stronger and he needs to nerf you in particular but i usually don't tend to nerf a singular player i just kind of have a little bit more fun with them when i'm dming them so i don't know uh d2 um the archer just being able to put out consistent damage from like a good range i would just call them strong i wouldn't call them o overpowered but there's a couple other things going on here. Like, that's that's a real tough one, bro. I'm sorry. Everyone at the table is there to have fun. No one wants to be Robin in a room full of Batmans. The the problem being described here is quadratic wizard linear fighter, right? It doesn't matter how high your, your saves are if the wizard can stop time and summon meteors and the cleric can cast wish. So <laughs> the, there's, there's, there's a couple different things at play. I would suggest a quick huddle with your, with your DM and talk about how you feel, you, you feel a little nerfed. You can ask him to revert the changes or you can ask to see if there's another aspect of your build that they're comfortable powering up in exchange just to let you keep up without cracking encounter design. Um, now, if you're a DM who's struggling with this, 
I would suggest adjusting your encounter design, mix it up a little bit, change the demands that combat makes of your player party, push their kit harder, or make them use the rest of their skill set. I would suggest a book called The Monsters Know What They're Doing by Keith Amon, because it teaches you how to read a monster stat block and how to use them, what they are good at, different monsters, different um, characteristics, different qualities, and it lets you make the make combat harder by knowing what a monster would be good at not necessarily by number go up so uh, hope that helps another thing you can do here is that part of the issue here is the inquisitor's bane ability which is extremely powerful hmm. which we get um but as a dm one of the easiest ways around that is simply to design encounters that don't only have one monster type yeah because that way he would uh, need to nerf you that 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 forces the the inquisitor archer to pick his targets yeah. mm -hmm. uh and i think that would be one way to design your encounters to give a little bit more um difficulty and and kind of strategy involved without you know nerfing a character it's just changing your encounters yeah have having a couple or maybe three high value targets that bane would be good for to not to not have one obvious way through the encounter every single time. One, yeah, one obvious I mean, target. And if you're not picking that target, you're wasting your time. Well, I mean, yeah, it's like if, if you're fighting a a swarm of goblins where some are shamans and some are fighters and some are whatever. Yeah. Sure, uh, that's multiple high-profile targets, but the bane is just going to be across the board. What, what you can do is you can mix up the kinds of things that are within the horde so that you mm. have things that aren't just goblinoids. And if you do that, you can like, that might be part of the problem you're running into or your GM is running into. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Bringing, so uh, bringing or the lack of uh, variety for the monsters makes it easy for a single target type to take out or, or even groups like hordes or swarms would be relatively easily to, deal with as well and that's kind of a situation so you'd need to definitely add options yeah, some uh, some dungeon masters can run into kind of a rut when it comes to the monsters that they favor it's like uh, you end up with a DM as kind of an undead guy like throws a high percentage of undead at you or some DMs are really into having human type enemies so they spam a lot of that and, you know, just kind of mix it up, I think, from the DM side. From the player side, it sounds like you've got a little bit of the Hawkeye problem where everyone has uh, really cool superpowers and you're a guy with a bow. Um, <laughs> and that, yeah, that, that can be a little bit rough. But um, one of the things you have to remember is, <clears throat> you know, your wizards, even though they're spamming fireballs, they do have a limited number. You have whatever fits in your quiver. And you can... Uh, do things to add power to your character if you feel like you're dropping off a little bit. You have enchant, you have magic uh, options for your weapon. You have magic options for your ammunition. You have uh, item slots for your body if you feel like you want extra abilities. So uh, you know, uh, feel free to uh, to take advantage of those upgrades that the game provides. All right, uh, question number two comes from Street Guy. Uh, thank you for all the content that you've given us. Uh, there's so much I have yet to watch. Uh, well, we have playlists for that kind of thing. My question is, do you think there's a class that's too underpowered to play? I know all the members of the Dice Bag have <laughs> strong feelings about this one. Uh, DA, why don't you uh, start us off? Uh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll start. Um traditionally uh our our group the dice bag has uh looked at this and, and there's certainly one class that all of us agree on and that's the witch uh, i can confirm uh where the witch is like a really fun idea and there's some really great mechanics in it and then like the hexes are just not good enough or you can't use them enough times to like make the class worth playing i feel kind of the same way about the shaman I feel like the shaman has some really good ideas behind it, but I don't feel like the spirit is good enough. I want the spirit to be more viable as as a companion rather than just kind of this bonus thing. 
And, and I so I feel both those classes have such great ideas, but if I were to if I had a player in a game who wanted to play one of those classes, I would drastically rework uh, the Hex and the Spirit in order to make the class worth playing. Because as it is, I've had players who came up to me and say, hey, can I play a witch? And I said, do you really want to play a witch or do you want to play a sorcerer? Because the sorcerer is just a better witch. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> that that feels bad. <laughs> uh, D2, what are your thoughts? Um, I... I agree. The witch feel feels like it needed a little bit more time in the oven, but the playing D and D or Pathfinder or running the games, you're you have to do some design work. So it's like if someone wants to play it, and you know that they probably wouldn't have a good time, you can with items or with you know homebrew feats or just changing the class at the table, just modifying it for your own table. You you can you can do that. And if someone's married enough to the fantasy of playing a shaman or playing a witch or really playing anything that's a little underpowered or a little simple compared to the, to the other classes, you maybe there's no other thing for it than just to, all right, bring it to the table. And when, when the character starts to feel weak, fundamentally, you know, you can, you can pump it up a little bit, but um, I actually have a, a specific answer for, for this one, which is what feels underpowered to play. Um, for me, my specific answer, hard agree on which, but my answer is a cavalier in a campaign where the DM says, hey, sorry, man, my dungeons can't fit your mount. You have to leave it outside. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's that's and, rough. And, 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 and D8 knows exact. D8 was at the table when that started happening. Yeah. Um, um, but honestly, everything in the game can find its place into a team comp. Um, though some DM tweaking might be required. The only thing I, I can think that could make a class unplayable was like subclasses swapping out important abilities for things that are just straight up worse or changing out things that really don't need to be swapped out. But be, but besides that, you can, you can find a way to make most things viable. I don't want to speak too hard in absolutes, but, uh, that's, that's my concrete answer is, <laughs> A cavalier where you don't get the cavalier. It's like, it's like a paladin who needs to cast atonement. All right, so, uh, <laughs> can or a fighter with uh, no feet. Or a fighter with no feet. <laughs> so it's confirmed D2 is a Jedi, uh, not a Sith. <laughs> um, yeah, because I, because I don't want to talk in absolutes, you know? Uh, D12, what are your thoughts? I think, uh, like, like, like with the rest of the group, the witch just does, has that special place of, uh, under my foot that I just kind of, every once in a while, look down and go, are you viable yet? <laughs> <laughs> and and realize that the only way that's going to happen is if I can really convince, as D2 was saying, the DM to make it viable. <laughs> uh, which it doesn't usually happen without some much needed or, or much seen help. Um, I think my individual one, though, that I would pick outside of, like, the Shaman has its problems, but it, it, it's, it's okay. Um, the cavalier in its situation, I agree. Once you get mounted, <laughs> it's 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 such a different game for you. Uh, okay, okay. In 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 the defense of my of of my DM, that's a tough position to be in. It to, is. It is. But but as a player, I would have loved if he would have told me, "Hey, don't don't take a large mount," or "Hey." take a small cavalier so you can have a medium mount and then it works. I would have loved a little bit of communication, but yeah, I'm not, I'm time. not mad at the DM because I know that's a, that's a big toughie. Bring uh, a team just... of dwarven builders everywhere you go to expand the hallways. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it's like the action economy on that's really bad though. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have another question about initiative in here somewhere and having to rapidly reconstruct every every dungeon because it's like from 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 the dm's perspective it would be work but yeah. you could just size stuff up right you can literally you you can just you know make it bigger it's it'd be a lot of drawing work but it's it's possible to accommodate for stuff like that just some prep work ahead of time is needed like if i had a player come to the table hey i want to i want to take a lion or i want to take a tiger's amount i 
in order to let them do that, I would need to make sure that not all the combat happens in a dungeon or you're, you won't be able to be mounted, but your mount can still come with you. And it's like, okay, cool. Then we, we, you still get to do a little bit of your stuff, but that's, that's, we're belaboring the point at this point. So yeah. for myself, I'm going to say <clears throat> I 100% agree on some of the archetypes where it's like, wow, that's a cool idea, but all I get are crap abilities and I lose the stuff that's part of the core of the class. So I feel that way about yeah. any alchemist archetype. Yeah, that a loses lot of bombs. the alchemist archetypes. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. it's like, why would I? Why would you ever lose your best class feature? <laughs> um, you know, it's it's a bit of an ask. But if there was one particular class that hasn't already been mentioned, I would say medium. Uh, medium's really mm. cool. It's got some great abilities. It is really awesome. Like from a DM RP perspective, the kind of things you can do with it. But what they do is they start you off as a worse version of everyone else. And they give you the the ability to make yourself almost as good as someone who is dedicated to doing the thing that you're trying to do, and it's like, wow, man, that is that is a hard uh, that is a hard life to have. Yeah, they feel underwhelming. I remembered what the class was now. It was the vigilante was yeah. my class that has the how the hell are you supposed to do this? Like the DM and you literally have to build the character together to even have a chance at doing it. What I love about the Vigilante is that it has an incredible high power, but it's so reliant on this weird switching persona mm-hmm. that it's like, when do I get to switch? Per- like, what happens if I'm ambushed? <laughs> right? <Exactly. laughs> like, am I just I'm screwed? In- Why can't I <laughs> use any of these abilities if I'm not? In what happens if, if there's no phone booth on this block? And yeah, I like, it, it's, it just seems so rough to like, try to like- work in. Like I think it'd be fun to do a campaign where everyone's a vigilante. Yes, but but it's that like if 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 right. But if the campaign, if the story isn't built to accommodate it, you run into a lot of hitches. Yeah, and it happens so often that it's not worth touching the class. That's that that would be the class, in my opinion, that basically says it's it's un it's not necessarily that it's underpowered. It's that the class system makes it so it can't work with most campaigns without a lot of yeah help. well when you're one guy switching identities in a city it's less <laughs> obvious than oh hey we're in this dungeon where'd peter Pir- parker go oh hey spider-man how long have you been in the, the tomb of horrors with us <laughs> spider-man i need you i need you to find peter parker he's gone missing <laughs> oh wait hang oh, on. hey peter where'd spider-man go <laughs> Real quick, the witch does have one thing going for it, all right? A singular thing, and it has to be a dwarven witch. If you play a male dwarven witch, you can have a prehensile beard. Yes. Captain Stranglebeard. The it's, got one, it, Captain it's got one thing going for it. Even <laughs> a then... singular okay, thing! Having done this build, even then, <laughs> it is incredibly difficult to get the feet like, layout that you need in order to make it really work. <laughs> All right, so it has half half of one thing going. You know, they they need to just break that off and make it into its own like separate demi class. Call it like you know that the hair witch and give yourself <laughs> give give it like a higher base attack bonus. Uh, make the hair attack like a a true natural attack instead of a secondary, and come up with some some like augmentation BS like Pathfinder likes. Ooh, you have hair charms like woven into your hair or something. <laughs> we kind of neat. The the, the cool. your your beard or your hair has its own equipment slot. <laughs> it would be. It would take I put rings slot. in my beard. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we got a guy that puts well something close to rings in his beard. <laughs> I mean, I mean, like realistically, like beard and hair is a fine place for like jewelry or or adornments. Yeah. So y- you could use a slot for that, but. I don't know. As a DM, I'd probably say, like, look, if you want to wear your rings in your beard, you can do that. I'm not going to let you put extra rings on your hands that benefit from all of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How many rings can I fit in this beard? Well, I think I can fit about 20. So I'm going to go ahead and take all 20. Yeah, yeah I get I get 20, 20 magic rings. You know, Mandarin's over there crying his eyes out. But th- right. this, is not, this, is the, this is not a podcast for how – does, how, how do we make the witch work? Uh, that so, well, that's that we really should do that. We should like <laughs> do a full rewrite of the witch to make it yeah, actually yeah, work. Yeah. Uh, that would be a actually. So um, our next question comes from Aaron uh, Summers. I want to first. I wanted to say thank you. 
Uh, your crew has added clarity to the majority of Pathfinder classes across the board. Question, would you be willing to dive into third-party content uh, classes like Artificer, or would you only cover Paizo official classes? So, uh, first off, why don't you check out the revised witch, uh, the witch we <laughs> covered from D6 damage. Now, um... There should be an annotation on the screen. <laughs> Subscribe to our on Patreon. The link below. <laughs> <laughs> you click on the card in the corner. Don't forget to ring that bell. Uh, so what I would say is the that the link will be point... in the description. <laughs> All right, I'm done. 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 All right, please. So please, at, please, 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 please. so at this point, we've covered the majority of uh, Pathfinder classes. There are still a few that need a little more. You know, time, a little more attention. I'm open to looking at uh, third-party stuff, especially if it comes from some of the more, like, reputable third-party developers, you know, Cobalt Press, uh, guys like that, who, developers who really know the game, you know, because <clears throat> at this point, and I'm sure we're going to get into this later as we go down the list, uh, Pathfinder 1E is in a spot where if we want to keep enjoying it, you know, someone's got to pick up the torch. So that's kind of my feelings on it. We can't keep uh, we can't keep on living on what Paizo has given us forever, you know. Yeah, it's difficult though because not all third party is created equal, and Very there's true. a lot of third party stuff out there that is untested in a lot of ways. And to be honest, if we did want to go over this kind of stuff, we would need to test it ourselves. And so it's 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 something that we haven't looked into doing so far uh, and that we may in the future, but uh, I, I wouldn't hold your breath for it. Cause, I've tried uh, to sneak a third-party class in before. Didn't go over. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, there is certain things like like the um, the – whatever, the, the Book of War or whatever they did that where, like, Paizo was like, yeah, this is really cool. <laughs> or even Paizo was like, wow, we support this. Uh, that I think we would probably start with if we wanted to do that. But um, I don't know. That would take um, a little bit more work on our end than that so we've far put we've in so been, far. We, that we've been willing to do. I know. My first third party um, that I want to do, though, is the Gourmand. Food based magic? <laughs> it just sounds like. No. It does sound pretty no. fun. It, no, it's not nearly as it, 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 if if it was food based magic, that would be amazing. No, I basically it turns you into um, what was the one that uh ate people in Full Metal? Oh, a uh, gluttony. Um, yeah, it basically turns you into a gluttony. Uh, yeah, I was gonna say that could go in a couple just... directions. That could go like really fun and silly, or that could go just unnecessarily grimdark. Yeah, <laughs> I like I I, acid, bite damage. I want a uh, an archetype for the for the uh, the gourmand archetype for the alchemist, where instead of making potions, you just make food. That would be amazing. You maxed your cooking skill? Yeah. Level 99 cooking. And you just throw, like, jars of hot sauce at people <laughs> for the bombs or whatever. Yeah. Hell yeah. The salsa alchemist? Top the for you. Yeah. The salsa alchemist. <laughs> you, got, you got, like, a bandolier of ghost peppers? Yeah, exactly. No, I just have different styles of hot sauce. I'd be like Cholula for that guy, and Tapatio for you. <laughs> <laughs> you could you could be a guy from Benihana and make like the little volcano. <laughs> Do the fucking Naruto hand signs. Exactly. And then and then, and then make a little pile of onions explode. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so our next question comes from <clears throat> Fred Daniel. Initiative is done differently in many of the D20 games. My question is, are there better ways to handle rolling for initiative? Sometimes I ask, why do we even need it? Is there a problem with everyone just taking their turn? Uh, D12, what do you think? All right. So there is a better way for initiative, and I I use it from time to time in my games, but I don't always use it, uh, where I have them roll three initiative rolls at the beginning of session, and hmm. I and I put them in order. And I use those initiative rolls when the combat's about to start, so that way the combat starts almost seamlessly, where it's I just tell whoever's next in turn to go. Oh, it that's makes really it good. So much faster. That's a good idea. 
the only problem is is that if you have casters who don't know how to actually be casters and they don't have that forethought when it's their turn they're going wait what <laughs> <laughs> but that's but that's onboarding that's that's but, yeah. like that that's like hey when when you are thinking about what you're going to do like if you don't know what a spell does that's fine no one's going to memorize all the rules but like have the description out right yeah. so that when you yeah. hey i don't know what this does like cool read it out loud we'll figure it out right now like right. to do that right away instead of okay so where should i look all right but now this is going to take five minutes right. so it's yeah. like it's it's that that problem is is an onboarding problem however happens all the time yeah but yeah that's how i usually uh that's my simple like if i'm dealing with newer players or if i'm dealing with a group that i just kind of want the combat to go right i want it to go smooth i just kind of do that instead of having them roll initiative right before combat but if i don't like if they're doing something that causes a combat to start that i wasn't expecting to happen and i didn't do that at the beginning of session i go well shit <laughs> and roll initiative yeah D, what do you think oh that's me isn't it yes it is <laughs> um <laughs> I don't know. I've never had a problem with the rolling for initiative. I don't really ask myself if there's a better way to do it. I've certainly, we've tried a couple of different games of different types, and I think it's fine. I've certainly known DMs who, instead of having the enemies roll for initiative, they let the players take all of their turns, and then they do the enemy's turns. I, I got no problem with that either. Uh, I I just normally kind of do standard. I roll for initiative for each type of enemy, and then I, you know, it goes the way it goes. So I, I don't know. I don't really have much to say on this one. Well, I'm going to give an answer that I actually don't like uh, having to give, but sometimes it really is uh, the only response is it's situational. There are circumstances where if the combat goes on long enough, did it really matter what everyone's initiative was? Not really. But if you've got guys who are like really heavy DPS where they can knock out uh, people where they can, they can knock out enemies with one hit. Yeah, it matters when they go in the initiative. So, if you know if you got something like that, then you know um, then it matters. If you've got the Inquisitor, which is all about getting off that first shot, then yeah, it matters. Um, but if everyone's playing like something where it's not a huge deal when exactly they go, then maybe at that point you take your turn. Also, enemies have a huge uh, impact on it like if you're going up against a goblin like horde of like 20 enemies just in terms of feasibility you can't you know like it's harder to roll for that many individual enemies than to just have them go as a single unit you know so um i would say think about the game you're in and if you think that initiative isn't really adding anything at the end of the day, it's all at DM discretion. Can Go I ahead. chat for a second about that one? I, yes. I, I was kind of, I was kind of waiting for, from. Thank you. Uh, I uh, want to chat about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so because D and D in these games are simulations of reality, it's the most complex thing there is. Some of the translation results in a little bit of friction. So, initiative is is supposed to simulate everyone roughly acting at the same time. Um, you can try acting out. Uh, uh, like D8 said, one side at a time, XCOM style. You should just remember to use your set actions, like Overwatch in the translation, uh, to make sure that everyone is making smart decisions. And then as a DM, you should just uh, remember these fights are going to swing harder back and forth. So I would say be gentle, but I would also suggest fielding things that use traps. Um, there is no problem with everyone taking their turns. It changes the flow of the combat, the rhythm, the way the game is going to feel to play. But it's up to your players. Start a conversation, try some stuff out. Maybe your group will like something better. And if you specifically have a problem, something's bothering you about the way traditional initiative feels, I would tell you to really pay attention to what about the thing bothers you and then try to address that. So it's like, what about rolling initiative? makes you wonder hey wh why do we do it like this um because sometimes it's a it's your table has a problem with it or you have a problem with it i i would suggest really narrowing down on what exactly is bothering you about it uh but anyway d12 uh, yeah and like i guess to go back to the 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 role or uh the ending part of the question i'm going to work my way backwards uh 
the only real problem with one side versus the other side going is like when they like what the others are saying when uh, one person is really a heavy hitter or a power swinger and they can down an opponent that would otherwise be able to do damage or mitigate damage on the field is why most dms tend to use the initiative because it gives each of the enemies an equal opportunity chance to get out there and do something or be killed but the player doesn't necessarily know which monster is going where in the initiative, so they don't know if the monster that's right in front of them is going to be the one that's biting at them, or if the monster that's, you know, in front of their ally is going to bite somebody else or whatever. And I think the the main purpose for initiative is just to add in that little nuance of the unknown yeah, versus the, them versus us. There's a there's a great mystery in that in that first round of combat. Yeah. not exactly knowing who is going when that makes people be either um, either really careful out of caution or really aggressive out of, all right, I get to go now. I don't know who else is, is going to go uh, after me. I should, you know, both yeah. barrels now. Uh, there's exactly. a, there's a, there's a real, there's a real meaty mystery in that first round. Yeah. And that's, and for me, that's the main, like, that's why I also love using my other system where I, I, I take the initiative roles way before combat's even suggested. So that mm. way, when it does start off, you're like, oh shit, I'm in this situation. I see who might be an enemy and now I have to go. <laughs> that, that, that feels like a cutscene transitioning seamlessly into gameplay with, with no fanfare, <laughs> just having it bleed perfectly in. Yeah. It's it's just real fun in my opinion. Yeah, but the but the point is, there's lots of different things you could try. Pick one, try it out for a couple sessions, and talk to your players. Maybe yep. something will feel better. Mm -hmm. Especially if you are the DM in this situation. Now, if you are the yeah. player, you you you're gonna really have to either sit down and talk to your DM, or just go to other groups and see if they do it differently. All right, our next question is going to be a fun one, I think. What is your favorite way to play against type? Uh, for race and class combo. Also, what is your favorite race class combo for playing two type? This is going to be a fun one. Uh, D2, why don't you uh, start us off then? Okay. Um, so, because the vast majority of my um, of my tabletop play is as the game master, um, I don't have a super favorite. I just have things that I like. Um, so I like uh, smart orcs and dumb elves. Uh, I, I, because, because for me, it's not necessarily ancestry class archetype combinations, but for me, it's like how, how I play them usually. So it's like, for me, I like to capitalize on my own failures opportunities for drama, right? Like I like it when the thing my character is good at doesn't work, especially in ways that reinforce character or campaign themes. Basically Far Cry 2 is my favorite Far Cry. Um, but, uh, I don't have favorites to play in the type but i think all the classic ones can be really cool places to start like orc barbarians elven rangers you know all the classics human idiots that kind of thing um so that's that's my my piece on this is kind of painting in broad strokes the human idiot is my favorite well who doesn't love that one <laughs> uh, d12 what are your thoughts uh, playing against type I I don't know. I don't really know how I can answer that question. I don't know if I've ever actually really played for or against the type in any of the in in any of my games really. I kind of do what I do because I enjoy it as both a DM and a player and I try to make sure that it works as seamlessly as possible and when it when it edges too hard, I try to find a way to either backtrack, get rid of it or uh make it work better <laughs> or kill it. <laughs> I don't know how to answer that one for myself. I don't. Uh, I guess my favorite. I don't know. I don't even have a really a favorite race class combo either, because I'll, I'll jump around. Yeah, because because like the 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 archetype is like the premise for a character, like the yeah. the 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 type of character defined by like their role in the story is way more often how I design my characters. Yeah, exactly. And, and way less by you know the meat and potatoes, but what does the math on the piece of paper say? I, I think way harder and I do way more work to design a character's place in the story or in a party composition, either mechanically or thematically than I do, you know, but do I want to use a bow or like, 
a crossbow. Like that's that's just not how I how, how I do my writing. However, it's perfectly valid if that's how you write your characters, man. Teach their own. Yeah. No, it was just like I was thinking about it, and it's like after I read the question again, it was just like I was looking at pin as an example. Yeah. And it was just like there is no way that that is optimized for anything other than to enjoy <laughs> the, the chaos that can yeah. be had. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but but like not not every player is going to be. But look at how good my math is. Right? Usually, it's like. I really love what my character's going for, roleplay opportunities, you know, themes at like just the vibe of the character, the aesthetic. I love the way that the character is playing. It's n- different yeah. players are going to value different things about different characters. So it's, it's, this is a conversation about finding, finding your fun. Like I've yeah. had plenty of fun playing characters who are not optimized because, because that's not how I have my fun, but I've been oh. at, at, at tables with people who do have their fun that way. And the table has room for everyone. Most times I would say. Yeah. I, the I issue agree. here is, is that we're not talking about optimization. That, that, uh, that's uh, very, very true. We're talking about like, well, we're talking about whether or not a player has good or bad imagination. Uh, mm. And because if you're playing two or against type, that's a failure of imagination in my mind. I, I I I would I would say it's not a failure because until you develop the design chops and the design muscle to start playing around, right before you start playing a little bit of jazz, I think there's nothing wrong with starting at one of the classics because, like, to start with an elf ranger or you know a human wizard or 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 whatever, like for for some folks they're not they're not bad at it they're just they don't know how yet and to yeah. start at one of these classic places there is absolutely nothing wrong with that some of us have have been playing i think everyone in this call has been playing role playing games for a really long time that we that we know how to do that let me explain myself a little bit sure. better cuz i do agree with you and i think when you're first starting off there's nothing wrong with that Okay. But I think characters and players who uh, stick to traditional ideas or who go to the opposite of traditional ideas are failing to situate their character within the world yeah. or, or are failing to uh, look at the character as a person rather than as a mock-up. Yeah. And so I think there's a difference from when you're starting – to when you're you've been playing for a while and i'm mainly looking at those who've been playing for a while because when you're starting you don't really know what's what's the real nuances yeah Uh, and so some people will you know there's nothing wrong with going human fire for your first character Mm -hmm. you know because you gotta learn the game yeah i I think i see what you're saying right there and then with that in mind it's like uh I, I look at it more so as I don't choose to go into that the the race class com uh, to special or I guess to optimize to the full potential, but yeah. I choose to play towards my story. So yeah, my DM has a story the, the that king. has yeah. If my DM has a story what? that my character was on a certain path and all of a sudden it, it, it totally comes to light that I should go a different path, I'm gonna go the different path. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah well, yeah. It, so, yeah, and what I'm saying is is that when you decide you're going to play the idiot orc barbarian yeah uh what you're doing is you're is you're no longer looking at that character from the position of where his story is and where it can go you're looking at a one note thing that you were planning to hammer home i i I think i think it's not i think the whole concept of two and against type is something that should never play into when you're creating your character i agree I, 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 I would say if that's how you build your characters, you know, power to you. But I would also tell you that more things are possible. Different things are possible because as someone who's, who's been playing for, for a while, sometimes you want to play an Arc Barbarian or, or an, or an Elven Ranger. That, that it's like you can choose those things specifically because you want to go after the fantasy of those combinations specifically. That's not the way everyone's going to make their characters. That's not the way anyone has to make the, their character. But if, but if you are doing it because you think you can't do anything else, like nothing else is possible, that's when I'd like to, you know, I can show you the door. You're the one who has to walk through it. 
of you know the the rest of the weird shit that's possible <laughs> um <laughs> the fun but, yeah, yeah, the, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you can have fun doing this classic stuff, but I would say you can also have fun doing some other stuff that this is, this is going to be kind of weird phrasing that you might not know that you want yet because you don't know that it's possible. So, so I think I'm mainly talking to newer players who, who might not understand the breadth of character creation that so many things under heaven and earth are 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 possible when you can do whatever whatever the heck you want um, or or for those players who are always feeling rushed at character creation so yeah. they always immediately go to a go to instead of yeah, actually yeah, sitting yeah. down and looking at what's possible yeah 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 let it let all those let ideas so marinate a little bit bro you'll be you'll be you'll be okay so you'll be just happier fine. yeah so much happier if you actually sit there and marinate in your thoughts and go hmm but maybe but maybe yeah, yeah. <laughs> like like the when 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 I played in games, like I'll make two or three characters, and then and then bring those to the table, and then and then make more decisions about how those characters flesh out or which character to play as I'm taking in the the you know the session zero as I'm taking in a conversations with the DM or the other players about what the game is going to be like, and then I'll usually make my final decision. But it's like. Like don't don't rush character creation. It's some of the it's it's where everything everything's gonna start. Take your time. <laughs> yeah, so I'm gonna <clears throat> as a jumping off point use the idea of the fantasy. Some might call them archetypes, some might call them stereotypes, but I think those are ingrained into the fantasy of what you want to play. Like <clears throat> one of the things that, that bugs me is when some of these, you know, archetypes that are, you know, kind of special and unique. They get uh, sort of boiled down to a level where it's like, oh, so what What really is this? My uh, my go-to example is like in Final Fantasy XIV, uh, n- a number of us have played it, uh, the elves yeah. in Final Fantasy XIV feel nothing like elves. They are humans with pointy ears. When the bunny yes. race feels more like elves <laughs> than the things that are called elves, it's like... Hey, I feel hey, like, hey, 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 like are something... you being derogatory right now? Are you talking shit about Vieira, bro? Uh, are we about to throw down right now? All, oh, all, all I'm saying is that uh, if if you couldn't see him and you just read, this is what the race does, which one's an elf, I, I, I think you'd have to think about that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I'd be confused, that's for sure. Uh, so I will say that if that's, so if there's like a race class combination, you know, like, like Elf Ranger or Orc Barbarian, where that sparks you. That's what you want to play. That's uh, that's the the that you want to live that dream. I I think yeah. that that's cool. I think that that's awesome. You yeah. know, um, some races are just built for it, like enchantment uh, oriented Katsune. It's like they are they are built to do that really well. And I think if that's uh, if you find your fun there, you know that's that's a good one. I think that there is room with all with pretty much all of these things, but you can always be a little more thoughtful. Um, <clears throat> a go-to example of mine for that is tieflings, where it's like evil outsiders have so much variety, so much texture, and I think you do yourself a little bit of a disservice saying, "Okay, I'm going to be the edgy boy demon tiefling who's going to wear like uh, all leather and be a warlock and uh, just talk about how he wants to burn everything." Yeah, it's like yeah, yeah. you could be and I'm going to have a dark and edgy past like <laughs> like if 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 that's what you want go for it bro but make it your own yeah yeah yeah, like, yeah 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 it can it can be more yeah you could you could be like a clip off uh descended tiefling who's got like a bunch of eyeballs and tentacles and you legitimately don't understand why people don't like having their limbs ripped off you could play a uh, a devil uh, descended tiefling who decided, you know, I'm going to go into the family business. Going to be a lawyer. I'm I'm I'm, I'm, I'm going to be a landlord. Family business. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I'm going to ruin lives the old fashioned way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like, how are you so evil? What is your magic or bloodline? Just like, no, this is just. There's no magic in it. It's all business. Our human. It's all business. <laughs> mm. That's a great uh, concept for for a tiefling, isn't it? What, the, the, it's just a business tiefling. Uh, one of my one of my favorite um, 
uh, tag team characters I did with uh, D8. These characters called the Gnome Brothers, and they are gnome necromancers who come from basically uh, a Smurf village type of setup where there's a big rainbow. All the gnomes just run around singing songs and baking cookies, and they hated it. <laughs> and that was the call to adventure. That's the impetus. Yeah. Nope. They're like, where's the death? Where's the destruction? Lollipops and rainbows. Where's all the seasoning, man? It's so boring here. <laughs> Everyone's so happy all the time. All right, so all right. our next question comes from uh, Riley. My question would be, any plans to update or expand upon some of your older videos and their content? I will say possibly. So Pathfinder is, uh, it went through a period of <clears throat> a lot of dynamic growth. So older videos like The Barbarian, uh, I think that would benefit from, you know, examining where it is now in terms of archetypes, uh, in terms of what they did, you know, the stuff they patched in, essentially. Especially the Unchained stuff. <laughs> yeah. Uh, things like the Unchained Rogue, Unchained Summoner. Those do change the classes, and I think um, looking at some of those older videos, as much as I, I am proud of them and I am proud of uh, what happened, uh, sometimes the production values kind of weren't that great. You know, I've, I've learned a lot about the, the editing biz in that time, and there's just new content, and I think that the videos could definitely uh, be updated to reflect that. Also, I think some of the discussion videos we've ha had, you know, we have... Uh, We've had our some of our assumptions uh, challenged, uh, some of mm -hmm. our assumptions reshaped, and some of our assumptions about things uh, absolutely hardened uh, by experience. <laughs> right. That's true. <laughs> our next question is, in your opinion, uh, this is a technical question, uh, does a natural attack from an animal companion, such as a... Uh, something called a slithering sundew. Sun sun uh, yeah, it's a plant. Kind of, it's pretty cool. Oh. Oh, that's cool. Um, that has a uh, two slam attacks. Uh, does it get the debuff of two weapon fighting? Uh, did any yeah, of you guys I would like, find? I would like to. Answer yeah, this. there, yes. there, there, there uh, is a a technical. There is, a, there is a correct answer to this, and that is no. It's because it's part of a natural weapons. Go to combat in the combat section. There's natural weapons. Read that because uh, it's completely different than two weapon fighting. <laughs> uh, it's completely different than fighting with literally anything else, and yeah, it's, it's stupidly complicated in some attackers. ways. Because <laughs> it's it could, because it's going to change the way your your uh, your attacks interact with some of the systems. It's, yeah, it's it's, it's, it's going to change where you're coming from, and not a whole lot about the way the game teaches you to play is going to is going to no natural weapons are their that. own thing entirely, yeah, 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 and yeah. it's they're they can be ridiculously complicated in a lot of ways. Yeah. Uh, but it's there. You can't use any other rules but the natural weapon rules and the natural attack stuff because yeah, it, when, it just does not compute. Yeah, when when the normal attacking rules conflict with the natural attack, you you side with the natural attack rules whenever there's a conflict. Basically, though, I don't off the top of my head think there could be any. But no, I think uh, I think the slams are considered primaries, which. Basically, just means you, you attack with full base attack yeah. bonus. Yeah. So, so it's um, so in the stat block for the slithering sundew, like it's it just lists the stuff that that it can do. And natural attack rules, they are all considered primary. So unless an attack is is specifically denoted as a secondary, it's all it like it's all primary. Um, so it doesn't benefit from two weapon fighting feats, but it also doesn't uh, it. It, it it doesn't suffer from two weapon fighting penalties, so yes. uh, so there so there's that. Yeah. But as always, it's it's your game. You can if it something sounds cooler or makes sense for your game, you you can just change it if it makes more sense to you. the The rules police aren't going to kick down your door and confiscate your your core rulebook. Um, uh, I will. <laughs> Okay, then then I will <laughs> break down the other side of the house to try to stop him. Oh no! Yeah, uh, we'll get in a cool fight. And it'll, it'll, be awesome. um, it'll just be but, happening uh, in the background as you're playing. Just ignore it; yeah. they'll go away. Yeah. yeah. So uh, the yeah the slithering sun so, because it doesn't say otherwise. They're considered primaries. Yeah. So the 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 rules as written, that's the answer. They're not they're not weapon attacks. They are natural attacks. 
and thus don't have anything to do with 2 Epic Fighting. Our next question comes from Dextro3. I'm new to Pathfinder 1E, so I would like to ask, how does the action system work? Uh, due to there being so many different types, it's very confusing. My DM says he kind of doesn't even know if he's running it correctly. Man, big mood. Uh, sometimes bold. Sometimes I you like just like it. don't know where to look it up. <laughs> I like it. It's bold. Yeah, but that's a bold strategy, Cotton. See how it how it shakes out. Um, <laughs> Maybe I'm a weirdo, but I find it actually considerably more simple than things like Pathfinder 2, which are designed to be simpler, but are they stupid in my mind. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so so to tackle the question, there there are there are a couple different kinds of action in well, the game the and you yeah, right. So there's 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 full round, um standard, move, swift, and then free. So in the fiction of the game, those take up different amount different amounts of time in and the focus. mechanics and focus, concentration, et cetera, thank you. Um and in um in the mechanics of of the game, uh, different things that you can do take different amounts of time. So there are spells that say you need a full um, a full round, or you can spend a full round um, taking a defensive posture or attacking. Um, there's the standard action. Um, so the different things that your character can do will take up different amounts of time, focus, and thus will require different actions to use. Um, so uh, those are the different kinds of uh, of actions. It's going to be in the core rule book of what the actions do and what they can be used for. And then outside of that, it's going to be um, a little bit more character specific of like in your characters, in your like your class uh, section, it's going to say using this ability is, is this action, using this ability is this action, etc. Thank you for watching part one of this D6 Damage Q&A. Be sure and keep an eye out for part two, which is on its way very soon. If you'd like to support my work outside of YouTube, check out Sorceress, a dark fantasy mystery RPG available right now on Steam. Follow the link in the description to watch the trailer. And if you would like more strategy guides and class analysis for Pathfinder and D&D, check out D6 Damage on BitChute and YouTube. Finally, if you'd like to take your game further, join the D6 Damage Discord. We have all kinds of fantastic discussion about all aspects of the game, including character builds, RP, and more. Oh.